Good morning, Bill. Hello, Robert. How are you? I'm doing great today. How about you? Fine, thank you. Get the mood indigo here, just, <laughs> just right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Bill, one sec. I'm going to tinker with the lights a little bit. Okay. Is that okay. too bright, Bill? Uh, let's see. Uh, no. I, well, uh, well, your forehead is... Uh, careful, careful. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, can, I should talk. <laughs> it's, um, it's prominent. Uh, yeah. Uh, um, yeah, maybe I'll, I'll take, turn that overhead off. All right. Okay, that's better. Yeah. That seems a little less radiant. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. Okay. All right. <laughs> I know. Well, guys uh, of our vintage, we can, uh, we can chuckle about that. Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, you, you told me that my Technical podcast is, has like 45 views, and I'm I'm now neck and neck with you. I, I don't know why. <laughs> I, I, I don't know how to explain that. <laughs> well, it, but it's just a matter of time, I think, right? You know, the well, things, well. Different, different things will hit. Uh, no, I, yeah. I just, I noticed it this morning and I find the, um, the PIPA accounting to be a little odd sometimes. Yeah. Uh, you know, get these mm. big bursts and I look and I'll say, why, oh, what, you know, some episode must have hit and then the, the highest number will be eight but there will be lots of eights and fives and sixes so it's yeah. it's a little mysterious to me but uh -huh. maybe there was is this your birthday or something is it a special <laughs> no <laughs> i don't know and, uh, uh, sean. There... hello sean hey how's it going good morning good morning how you doing bob Real good, Sean. How about you? I'm doing well, thank you. Now, do you, is there a triathlon in the uh, in the offing? Uh, so I'm still. I'm. Re I did a half Ironman about three weeks ago, and I'm kind uh -huh. of in recovery mode from that at the moment. <laughs> wow! Uh, wow! But, uh, yeah. but hope, hoping to sort of figure out what I'm doing next year here in the next next couple of weeks as the to turn the calendar the next uh, next year at this point. So. Right. Did and you do it in Florida? Uh, in Augusta, Georgia, actually. Oh. Uh, which is, a, you're probably you know, famous for the Masters Golf Tournament. Sure, yeah. Um, but they do, a, they do a race there every year as well, which is, which is pretty fun, actually. Because wow. it's a kind of small town when the golf tournament's not there. So mm -hmm. uh, ends up being, you know, taken over by the triathlon for, for the half Ironman there. So. It was good. Sean, just checking. Is Michael, uh, Michael still steaming away? He, he is. He is. Although, so their similarly, their <laughs> season kind of officially ends to, to the extent there's a season to it. Um, about two or three weeks ago, he had kind of his end of season party and all of that stuff, which is, I mean, it's just adorable. Like they get awards. <laughs> the whole thing is just kind of like, wow, this is a, um, it's yeah it's just adorable so he they don't have practices now again until um march 1st the first week of okay march, they'll kind of start back up so but he and his buddies like you know meet up at, to do their own training and stuff like that it's wow kind of, yeah so it's different from when you were michael's age right and you had to uh you had to cut down the forest and rip out the stumps <laughs> and sew your own soccer ball together <laughs> Yeah, uh, that's right. Yeah, uh, uphill both ways as well. Yes, <laughs> how it worked. How it worked. Strange how that'll happen. Yes. Sean, is there anything in particular you wanted to talk about today? So, so I, I'm good with what you want, but I was I was kind of thinking about it this morning. I thought, you know, there's obviously been a lot of movement on the WeWork stuff, 
uh-huh. since the last time we talked. So I thought it was maybe worth revisiting that. And then I thought, um, you know, some of this, this sh- kind of shifting in leadership, you know, we talked so much about SAP and where they're heading, yes. you know, it may be worth kind of, and I think that's probably more you and I together than, than just me, but I think that may be worth chatting a little bit about as well as uh, it's an interesting time in the cloud industry to put it, to yeah. put it mildly with, with Bill moving. And do, you, and do you know, I couldn't tell from the articles you wrote, how well do you know the, the sort of new co-CEOs of SAP? I have met, uh, so the younger guy, Kristen Klein, I've met him a handful of times, Sean, and uh, he, he's, <clears throat> you know, remarkably low key. Okay. Uh, incredibly smart. And I think he started, a, he got a part-time job at SAP when he was in senior year in high school. I think yeah. he was 17. So he's worked there for 20 years yep. and he's 37 years old now. And then Jen Morgan is like the uh, a direct reincarnation of Bill McDermott. Oh, is that right? Okay. Unbelievably personable. Um, you know, the first time you meet her, you'll feel like you've known her for a long time and you really, really want her to like you. Or yeah. I want her okay. to like, but, um, and just smart, personable, totally customer oriented, Christian, a great reflection inward. So yeah, okay. it, it, it's quite a combo. And, um, you know, if you go back just a couple of years, it's not like either of them at that time was, sort of knocking on the CEO's door. So um, a very, very fast ramp up for both of them. But Sean, those sound like a couple of great topics. Yeah, I, I was just, I was really, uh, <clears throat> I was really, I thought your article on Bill was just really interesting as someone who doesn't know him as well as you do. And kind of just, there were a lot of lessons there about leadership and leadership in an in industry that's transforming as quickly as, cloud computing is. And so it would be fun to chat that back and forth a little bit as well. So. Sure. And, and Sean, with that, one of the things that I thought was so interesting uh, was that the board of directors was right there in the front row and he pretty much MF'd them uh, yeah. in front of, you know, 12,000, their best friends, but the, the, the salespeople tore the roof off the place. Sure. what he said. And sure. so I guess if you're going to MF your, uh, your bosses, you want to be able to do, well, at least the, you know, come on, the salespeople are perked up, so it's worth it. Well, I think what you want to do is you want to make sure that you, that you actually execute, right? <laughs> Our old friend execution. That's right. Like, I think, I think that only works <laughs> yeah. if you then deliver quarters that, that, back, that back said narrative up, right? So. That's right. That's right. Um, Mr. Cozell, are we sounding okay? Yes, we are. Yes, yes, you do. Uh, uh, Sean, before we before we start, now uh, Bill and I are good friends, and he's he's been a fantastic professor. But boy, did he shock my confidence a few minutes before you came on. He said, "Bob, can you <laughs> fix the lighting so your big forehead uh, doesn't glare so much?" <laughs> <laughs> I should talk. <laughs> <laughs> well. <clears throat> Bill, fair enough. Okay. Okay. Um, Sean, I'll, I'm I'll go and mute. Thank you, Bill. And Sean, I'll talk for a second here as usual and uh, get the camera swung fully over to me. And uh, we'll, we'll move through a couple things, have some fun with this. And uh, yeah, it should be a great conversation. If anything pops in your mind too, Sean, you want to change directions midstream, you know, please feel free to do that. But here we go. Hello, everyone. Welcome to Cloud Wars Live, where we explore today's digital revolution by speaking with thought leaders and business executives who are changing how the world lives, works, plays, learns, and dreams. Our guest today is Sean Amirati. Sean, as you know, is a regular guest here on Cloud Wars Live. He's part of our monthly digital all-star series, and it's Amirati on innovation. Sean's a venture capitalist. He's a professor at Carnegie Mellon University, focusing on corporate startups. He's an author, a podcaster, and he too is a serial entrepreneur. Sean, welcome back. Always great to have you. Thanks for having me, Bob. This is going to be fun. Yeah, I think so. And Sean, so in that uh, entrepreneurial spirit to the, the, and uh, you know, the reckoning that sometimes comes to companies good or not always as good as they had hoped, you had chatted last time we talked a little bit about the folks that we worked and what happened there. What, uh, what do you think of how that's playing out? Yeah, so, so, uh, so the, the chairs continue to move for sure at, at WeWork, both literally and figuratively. Um, 
So, so it's interesting, right? So for people who haven't been following along since the uh, last time we talked about it, um, SoftBank has basically uh, double or triple or quadrupled down on the bet that they've made on WeWork, right? So we talked a little bit last time. I mean, this was a big bet already before decisions made over the last couple um, weeks here for SoftBank out of their first vision fund. And we talked about um, you know, the need for just incredible size outcomes for a fund like SoftBank when you're talking about managing $100 billion, right? And, you know, I was thinking about what's happened since the last time we talked, like, basically, most of the industry has decided that SoftBank uh, made a mistake on the bet on WeWork and that SoftBank needed to cut their losses and run. And instead of doing that, what the management team has decided to do is basically triple down and put even more capital in, in a combination of primary and secondary offerings to go ahead and end up owning, I think the last number I saw was they're gonna end up owning about 80% of the business when all of this is done. And so that's done through uh, putting more money in directly into the company to keep the lights on, keep the business operating, as well as uh, offering to purchase options and stock from uh, from early employees, including the CEO and founder, or the, the former now CEO and founder. And then apparently that offer wasn't sweet enough, so they also hired the, the, the former CEO and founder um, for a couple hundred million dollar, $180 million, I think it was, consulting agreement as well, um, which is a great, I mean, that's a good consulting package. I think we can all agree. Uh, $180 million for your time, that, that's that makes uh, doctors and lawyers look cheap. Um, but, which but, is, Sean, but Sean, over what period of time? I mean, 180 million, you know, over 5,000 years, it's not so good. You know, yeah, what? no, it's, 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 a, it's a short, it's a short, it's more to help. I think it's saying like, I think that the line was like consulting to help with the transition or something yeah. like that. Which it, um, so, so, so interestingly, the, the founder is going to walk away a billionaire on this. Um, but I actually think the more interesting thing is, is SoftBank's calculation here. Right, so um, a lot of people have argued that this is a sunk cost fallacy, that they've got so much money invested in WeWork that they're making a decision based on what has already been put, the money that's already been put to work there, which is very, very dangerous as an as a early investor or anybody who's funding innovation. Like you have to make decisions based on where you are, not the decisions that have already been made and the money that's already gone into it. I, I think the other side of it and the, the way SoftBank's trying to spin this and, and you know, history will tell uh, who's right here is that they're just, they're just that committed to the future of work changing and they're going to put more money in because they ultimately believe they're getting a chance to buy this relatively cheap for what they think it will ultimately be worth. You know, there were stories about uh, the chairman of SoftBank saying this could be the first trillion dollar company because the future of work is changing. Um, and so I was thinking about, uh, there's a great quote from a hedge fund manager, Howard Marks, who says, you know, to be a great investor, you need to be two things. You need to be contrarian and correct. I think what we can definitely agree at this point is that SoftBank is being contrarian, right? The, the consensus would not be to put more money into an investment uh, that has had literally $40 billion of enterprise value evaporate from when they started shopping the IPO to the point that they put that money in. On the other hand, if you're SoftBank, you know, and you really do believe the business was worth $50, 50 billion, then this is a quick 5x for you because you put your money in and, and the, the business continues to grow. And they end up effectively now owning 80% of the business at this point. Um, so we'll see which, which this ends up, but the, the, the chairs have continued to move, you know, um, this will be the interesting thing is um, what will ultimately the story will ultimately be written based on what happens to WeWork. And I think at this point you can say pretty definitively that the story that will be written on SoftBank is what happens to WeWork. You know, this this will either be you know enterprise defining for uh, SoftBank and, and and you know the same. This will be as memorable for them as you know the Alibaba investment is create that type of enterprise value, or they'll be wrong, and this will be the end of of SoftBank um, as we know it. I think the consensus in social media and from the 
prognosticators is that it's going to be the latter of those that, that, that like, okay, um, you know, this is just a, this is just a mistake. Um, but, but time will tell and, uh, we'll see. Do you have a thought on that, Sean? Yeah. So, so I, so the thing that I struggle with on this is I understand a lot of the assumptions that you build up to say, okay, there's still a viable business and we work, but I still struggle with how much of the, like, what's the right comparison for that? So I think that the part of the narrative that you see in the statements from SoftBank as they try to spin this is like, well, the future of work is changing, right? And, and you know, Bob, that's something we've been talking about for a long time, all the way back to, you know, the early 2000s with our friend Richard Florida, right? Like work is changing. That is definitely true. Um, the question is, is the right way to monetize that change of work being a real estate company? And then I think a related question is, is SoftBank a real estate company or are they a community, right? The, the challenge without having access to all the data is like, I don't pencil out to a 40 or $50 billion entity just based on that. So it feels to me like, um, it feels to me like that part of this story becomes complicated for, for someone like SoftBank. And, and they may need to have some, I mean, at this point, we work in SoftBank are the same thing. If you own 80% of a company, you, you are the company, right? So they may have a strategy for that to, to really do things that, that WeWork's been talking about for a long time, to monetize community in ways other than, you know, buying assets and slicing them up and, and leasing them out, right? I think we talked about last time, one analog you can make from a business model perspective is that WeWork is basically a rental car company. They buy expensive fixed assets and then they rent them in very short units of time. And you know, enterprise companies trade at like one times multiple, right? Real estate companies trade at, like it just that, if they end up staying there, I think it's very difficult to end up being justifying the types of valuations that they were floating about going public at not that long ago. Um, on the other hand, like, you know, what, what's, a more desperate for transformation industry than than how people live and work, right? And so, um, so maybe the way they monetize that platform today is not the way that they'll monetize that platform uh, in in a couple of years, and, and and we'll see. And they certainly now have put the company in a situation where they're not at the whims of other investors, they're not at the whims of the public market, obviously. And so, so so time will tell. Um, you know, my instinct a couple weeks ago when we talked about it was like, what they need to do is they need to take their medicine, acknowledge what they are and say like, okay, we're a, you know, a five to seven to maybe $10 billion entity. It's not a bad outcome. Uh, it's just not a soft bank size outcome. Uh, they've definitely taken a contrarian position there and we'll see if uh, we'll see if they're correct in a couple of years. Uh, but it's, it's been fascinating to watch the, 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 uh, the landscape shift there a little bit. Hey, Sean, one last thing I wanted to ask you, uh, your thoughts on about this. You know, uh, again, going back some number of years, a question that you and I have always enjoyed debating about companies and strategy is what business are you in? Right. And I think the tale that you've spun from last time and also today about, uh, you know, there's some people that, uh, well, you know, WeWork is, is one of these technology unicorns or we work is something unlike the world's ever seen before it's and i think ultimately right the not just from the value point of view but companies entrepreneurs uh big businesses trying to regain a sense of momentum and innovation they've got to be really clear today on you know what do we have here what what is the play what business are we in because especially yep. sean some of your specialty or one of your specialties of helping big established corporations regain a spirit of innovation, they've got to be profoundly clear, right, on what is this new thing and how do we, how do we play in that market? Yep. So I think, I think if, you, if they start moving in that direction and they start figuring out ways to monetize that other than selling real estate, this, this could end up, there's still a case for this to end up being a massive enterprise, right? One of the things that I think is going to be important for them is actually to put people in those leadership positions that actually can tell that story. Because right now, one of the things I'm observing is a lot of the stories are being told by the SoftBank investors, the, the uh, chairman that SoftBank's installed, 
right? They've got these, this sort of co-CEO thing going on here. And it, I think part of what you need is somebody to step out and, and at least rally the troops who remain, right? Because there's going to be a massive riff. Um, that's, that's painful. People are going to like, someone needs to stand up and say like, this is what we are. This is why it matters. Come, you know, let's go change the way people, the way people work going forward. They do have some interesting ingredients to do that though, right? So um, I think is Amazon has 5,000 deaths in New York on WeWork, right? Like that's a really interesting anchor tenant in a really interesting market for them, for example. So, so you know, it's certainly not going to happen in 2019 or, or probably even 2020. But if you had the right CEO who stood up and said, this is what we're going to do, that would be interesting. It actually, in some ways, reminds me of the article you wrote about Bill McDermott when he stepped into the CEO seat at uh, SAP, right? And stood up in front of the troops and said, this is what we're going to do. They're laughing at us. People are laughing at us in the press. The journalists think we don't know what we're doing. Analysts are making fun of us, but this is what we're going to do, right? And the sales force roars behind them, right? You can't, th that can't be done by the, the chairman installed guy who works for this and four or five other things for SoftBank, right? That, you know, you need, yeah. you need the Bill McDermott equivalent to like stand up and, and cast that vision and frankly have a time horizon that's long enough that like this can all play out. Like, you know, Bill, I don't, I mean, you were there in the room and, and I'll pause in a minute to let you comment, but I don't, I didn't get the sense that he was like, and don't worry guys in three weeks when we announce our next uh, earnings announcements, this is all, this is all going to be taken care of, right? You know, yeah. go ahead and, and double down on your Rolex watches and your next sports car. It was like, this is what we're going to do. And it's going to take time, but it's going to be worth it. And it's going to, it's going to be the kind of thing that you can be proud of 10 years looking back on your career. Right. And I think, um, I think the, the future, like the, the reason I am a little leery to shovel a bunch of dirt on the WeWork grade, even though I certainly understand all the individual components to make that case, is the future of work, it's still, and it still feels like they have an interesting 30,000 foot vision and they have some interesting components with things like these relationships with a bunch of interesting different companies, mixing them up with startups, like there's just, there's some stuff there where it feels like, man, if things broke the right way and you're, you lengthen your time horizon, that could be compelling. Now they got to skirt through bankruptcy. There's a bunch to get from here to there, but it just feels interesting. Well, Sean, if I could add, you know, one more uh, piece onto the list of what you talked yeah. about, I think your description of having a CEO in there, who's in some ways a portfolio manager of multiple other things is, the person might be brilliant and wonderful, but in a troubled company, in a time of transition, with a lot of question that their own employee base is going to turn over massively, I think you need this incredible focus. And to go back to around that time of Bill McDermott's commentary, in my time at SAP there, there was an event where uh, SAP had invited Pat Riley, the coach of the uh, uh, president of the Miami Heat to speak. Yeah. And afterward, there was a little event and I got to chat with him for a second. And I said, hey, Pat, you know, I remember when you were with the Knicks, the one line that you told the guys in training camp, he said, you know, guys, he said, this is it. It's us in this room. We've burned the canoes. Yep. And, uh, and one of the guys raised his hands <laughs> coach, what are the canoes? You know, what I came by, by car. So anyway, he was, he was dealing with some people who didn't quite get the analogy, but his point was, you know, this is it. It's us. There's not going to yep. be any trades. There's not going to be any salvation from above. It's up to us. And what are we going to do here? And I think McDermott's line that you referenced a little bit ago was, you know, SAP at the time, they'd turned through a couple of different CEOs. They brought him in everybody was feeling like, hey, why don't we just put our heads back down and just be what we've always been, be safe, just, you know, be who we are, do what we know how to yep. do. And everybody will, the world's changing, but they'll stick with us because we're different. And he stood up and his big point about that, Sean, what I think he connected as a leader with the people in the room that he wanted to talk to, he said, what in effect these people in the front row he said they're trying to steal your dreams because they're yeah. complacent and complacency is a thief and he he you know he roared at the crowd he said i will not let them steal your dreams so right. 
he put himself much more at risk than any of those salespeople in that room. And they sure. loved him for that. And, and the people to... in the front row were the board, correct? Like... Yeah, the board of directors. <laughs> right. Like, which, I... which is his boss, just to make sure everybody's following yeah. the story along. He basically insulted his boss, but, but, then, yeah. but then delivered. Right? I mean, effectively yeah. for, for a decade, delivered. Yeah, he pointed in the front row in this, you know, 13,000 people in the auditorium. He said, these people are laughing at you. He said, well, I'm not laughing. And uh, he went on like that. And I think now after uh, 17 years at SAP, 10 years as CEO, tripled the value of the company, set them on a path, uh, a a good path right now that I think they're on with cloud and innovation, becoming a broad-based company, much more customer focused instead of being you know, solely about, uh, you know, fabulous engineering. And now he's going over to a company service now as CEO. And I think, uh, I think that, that jolted some people, both at their current CEO, John Donahoe is leaving to go to Nike, right? Open the door for Bill. So it, the, the leadership changes are going to be pretty interesting in this business for a while. Yeah. And you've been following service now for a while, right? They're like kind of bottom, but still on your top 10 cloud wars list. Yes. Is that right? Yeah. So, so that's a, I mean, honestly, till I saw, Oh, th- who's this guy taking over as CEO of Nike. It's not a business that's was top of mind f- for me. And I suspect for, unless you're in the enterprise tech world, they may not be top of mind for people. Right. So wh- how do you think about a guy like Bill going t- to service now and kind of what th- their strategy could be? Well, Sean, you know, in uh, uh, all things in the world are relative. And uh, I am going to give an example of that. In my view, Bill McDermott's 58 years old. He's a young guy. Uh, yep. I want to believe very strongly that 58 is young. <laughs> Good. You don't have to Good. laugh quite that hard, Sean. But no, no, I was a, that was a laughter of agreement, Bob. <laughs> Absolutely. Yes, 100%. 58 is young. We'll go with that. 58 is young. And Bill, yep. he said, look, he said, I, I've spent, you know, half of my professional life with this company and it's been phenomenal. But he said, we have groomed some fantastic young leaders to come up. And he said, I would like to jump into a situation again with a relatively um, early stage publicly traded growth company. And he said, I think they've got some fantastic assets. He said, John's done a great job. The board's terrific. He cited the founder, Fred Luddy, and the type of innovation that Fred brought to this. Um, ServiceNow was named I don't know, I think it was uh, Fortune maybe, but within the last year, 18 months is the number one most innovative company hmm. in the world. Hmm. Um, they've been growing 35, 40%. They're, they're approaching now a billion dollars in revenue per quarter. They just hit 900 million. And their market cap with the ups and downs in the markets over the last several months has been between 42 and $50 billion. So they're not a tiny company. They've got a strong culture. They play, Sean, it's interesting. They found sort of some white spaces in between the big traditional uh, enterprise software companies. And in a way, that's great. But on another hand, right, if you're in a market where there's not a lot of competition, right, you're either the most brilliant person in the world and nobody can catch up, or there's a reason there's not a lot of competition. It's just not the market. So I think, Sean, based on that, that one of the big things McDermott's going to do is keep their current traditional business going strong, but he's got to move them into some other bigger, you know, more vibrant markets as well. So, so, so what, like, what are some examples of innovation that people might be, if you're in the enterprise space, people say like, okay, that service now, very innovative company, for example, they introduced, you know, are there things that they've done that, that, you know, have been transformative for the industry? Well, uh, you know, uh, and uh, I've, I've worked around the IT business for a long, long time, and uh, I have great respect for it. But in today's world, you know, there are parts of the IT business that are not that interesting. Sure. And, but they're essential. Um, I would say that among the not so interesting parts of the IT business are IT service problems. And you submit a ticket to get something yep. fixed. Well, ServiceNow came in and they automated that. And that worked beautifully and it allowed people to spend less time on unimportant stuff and more time doing productive work. Okay. They expanded that over to the HR side of the, of the business, right? Automated that. They're doing it now in customer service. They're moving it off to security as well. So this notion of, 
uh, automated and what they call digital workflows that tie in with everybody else. And I think in that way of Sean being in those white spaces, they said, let's make it easy for the folks in these fields to connect in with the big uh, HCM software yep. applications or with the customer service applications. And meanwhile, they are uh, quarter by quarter, they're stacking up really rapidly increasing numbers of people spending 5 million, 10 billion, uh, 5 million, 10 million, $20 million per year with them. So it's a, it's a terrific story. And it speaks to the fact that a lot of big corporations have workflows or processes that are, if not broken, they're, yeah. they're wildly inefficient. Well, and I think not only just inefficient, but like, as you start to automate, I mean, interestingly, it's, it's a different take on the same, the future of work thing, right? Yeah. So one of the things that, that, and, and part of it is, you know, Bob, you live in Pittsburgh and I spend a bunch of time in Pittsburgh. I think we in Pittsburgh actually have a skewed perspective on automation because of Carnegie Mellon, right? Like I was talking to um, somebody outside of Pittsburgh just this weekend and they were sent, and I was talking about self-driving cars, which to me feel at this point kind of um, almost boring. Like I remember 10 years ago when you'd see the self-driving Volvo driving around campus, like that was really cool and you would stop and, and like really watch it. Now it's like, oh, what do you, there's actually a human in that Volvo. That's, that's weird. Like we're, we're supposed, those are supposed to be self what are, what are the, you know, how quaint and old, right? But we, but, but because of that, right? I think being, you know, at arguably the, 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 the number one school in the world for that kinds of things. I think we tend to just view automation as table stakes today, right? Um, but interestingly, like outside of the little AI echo chamber that is Pittsburgh uh, and a couple other places like Silicon Valley and Boston and uh, a couple of places across the world, right? It's actually pretty amazing to people what you can do and, and the amount of work that can be automated that's, that's kind of what you would think of as routine and cognitive. And so that's interesting. I mean, I, I certainly was aware of them as a plane at the sort of white space of workflow. But if they're doing, you know, some type of continuum from robotic process automation to true AI and machine learning, mm -hmm. right, you can make a really compelling argument that that's going to just shrink, like, that, that what's not in that, but sort of, if here's what's automatable and here's what's not autom automatable, and today it's, you know, 80, 20, you could make a really compelling argument that those ratios are going to flip in the next couple of years. Um, and if you've already got experience doing, you know, concept to release products around the sort of workflow automation and doing innovation around that, that becomes interesting, you know, very, very quickly. Um, and it probably is a part of the story that they should, that, that could, be, could be very, very well received moving forward. I think so, Sean. And you know, one of the other things that John Donahoe, who had been at Bain, then he was at eBay, then, you know, service now for a few years and off to Nike. But I think one of the good outside in perspectives that he brought on this was that the company was not making mobile enough of, the, of a priority. So it has certainly been doing that. And it's spent relative to its size, a huge amount of uh, money and time building up a really uh, world-class, you know, user interface, user experience hmm. whole team. And this, they're finally making the mobile first. So in some of the, not just automated deep in the bowels of, you know, the organization, but out in the hands of employees from not just their company, but their customers who are able to, to do stuff on yep. the fly with the notion yep. that this can't just be sort of a good IT interface. This has to be world-class. So I think that's a big one. Sean, I know we want to chat a little bit about the new leaders at SAP, but as you mentioned, you know, um, robotic process automation and AI, I, I had to say that one of the things that jumped out at me in last week's earnings call with Microsoft is Sachin Adele said, we now have uh, 20,000 customers using Azure AI. Yeah. And I think he said uh, 85 of the Fortune 100. Yeah. Talk about a flex, right? <laughs> like, like, hey, I hear, I hear there's a company a little south of us that claims to be really good at that stuff, you know? Yeah. We're, we're pretty good at it up here in Seattle as well, right? I mean, that is, 
that I mean, the the scale is is fascinating, and it's it's interesting. I mean, you know, uh, my first two startups were AI startups. Like we didn't call them that because from 2001 when I started the first one and 2006 when I started the second, the only thing that there was pretty much a hundred percent consensus on was don't call it AI or <laughs> any term like that because you'll scare everybody out of the room. I mean, I think about how different the pitches would be if I were running those businesses in 2018 instead of 2001 and 2006. But I started them basically saying like, look, the, and again, some of this was driven by being in Pittsburgh and being at Carnegie Mellon where, where uh, you know, that is, Carnegie Mellon has been, you know, a decade plus ahead of the rest of, of, the, rest of the world on this uh, for a while. And so it just felt like, man, AI is going to change everything. That was basically the thing that got us motivated to start this business. So I say this realizing that, you know, if you keep saying something over and over again and you keep being wrong because you're too early, um, you know, maybe you're not that good at forecasting. You're just waiting for the world to catch up. But it does really feel like, man, over the last couple of years, when we talked about open AI a couple of podcasts ago, right? it feels like the, the world has finally caught up with this vision. I mean, 85 of the Fortune 100 working with Microsoft. There's there's huge overlap there, but you know, Google has their own and Amazon. They, they they each have their own offerings there. I mean, a lot of the Fortune 100 are probably using all three, but it also means that probably a hundred of the hundred are working with at least one of those three vendors at this point. I mean, just completely changing. Um, and I think there are some good answers for like why now this time is really why now. And and the interesting thing is like the right answer to why now when it comes to innovation is the difference between, you know, pets.com that goes boom and bust and Chewy that goes out at $10 billion market cap and is a, is a real business in every sense of the word. Right. So, uh, man, it, the, the time is now for that for sure. Um, and, uh, you know, Microsoft has examples of that, Amazon, Google, that like all these guys are, are, you know, building their, building their case for, you know, now being the time for that transformation to really change how we, how, how business works. And it'd be interesting to see how service now can, can play in that with uh, leadership who's pretty comfortable putting bold visions out there in front of people. Yeah. Somebody said something a little bit odd, uh, Ash McDermott about, you know, uh, you know, big company, not so big company. And he said, Hey, I'm not aware of anybody at service now who doesn't want to become a large company. He said, maybe I can, you know, uh, help to do it. It was just an interesting perspective. And uh, yeah. Sean, yeah. Um, so some of those things you talked about there, the vision, the leadership, the realization, you know, what your assets are, how you deploy them, right? That's got to be something that the two young and uh, new to the world of being a CEO, the two new co-CEOs at SAP are dealing with. Uh, What's that going to be like for them as they go from, uh, you know, powerful roles supporting the CEO to being the CEOs? Yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, obviously, I've never been CEO of a large publicly traded company, but I've been CEO a couple of times. And I can tell you, like, the, the job is much lonelier than you forecast when you move from being on the senior management team to, to being in the CEO seat. We, one of my closest friends was CEO and ultimately some health reasons I ended up taking over that business as CEO and I was on the management team had been there from day one and like it was a completely different experience being in that CEO seat and obviously it was a much much smaller business than what you're talking about when you're talking about a company like SAP but the, I remember I had a friend of mine who said to me well you know CEOs of tech companies and infants um, are are really the same. They wake up multiple times through the night crying, and then uh, you got to go. You got to go hit the hit the ground running uh, in the morning. Either way, right? And it's uh, it's really you know. I'm sure the stress level is ramping for them. Um, I do think this co CEO model, and I think Bill McDermott was co CEO when he first took the the role. Sorry, so it's a very kind of um, classic model. It sounds like for them. So at least they can lean on each other a, a little bit. But uh, it's going to be it's going to be lonely. My my hope for them would be similar to what it sounds like from the things you wrote about Bill's tenure, that they do the same thing. They, they don't become kind of encumbered by what got them to where they are, but they try to paint a picture for, picture for where they see the business going, right? I think credit to however the decision was made inside the organization to sort of not rest on their laurels, but, but try to create a new fresh vision. And then they use 
customers to anchor that vision. You know, no matter how smart those two are and everything I've seen written about both of them, it sounds like they're two incredibly talented and smart individuals, uh, but the market is smarter than they are. And hopefully they realize that, you know, the market in aggregate, not one customer in the market, but the cross section of all of their customers, that is much smarter than no matter how smart they are, they can be, right? So I hope they paint a vision and I hope they anchor that in customers and I hope they stay relevant because like the reality is the tech industry needs, like we don't need more consolidation uh, uh, among the large companies, right? I mean, to me, that was also part of the Bill McDermott thing. I think, you know, a lot of people back then were kind of like, well, you know, somebody will buy SAP. Like that, you know, the, right? That was sort of a, a narrative that you heard back then, right? And I think the steal your dream comment is like, look, guys, like, we don't want to go be a cog in a machine in somebody else's, somebody else's organization. We want to, we want to build the future and, and have that, that dream to reflect on what, what we did. Um, and, you know, the tech industry still needs SAP to be, a, to be a large standalone business, just like the other major players there. So I hope they don't rest on what got them there, but, but keep pushing for with the insights from the market as well. Sean, thanks. And I know uh, as you were describing that, uh, I, I was thinking it's a, one of my favorite lines about business is, you know, I believe that all limitations are self-imposed yeah. and it's what mindset that they choose to bring to it. And I think Christian Klein and Jen Morgan, very different sorts of people, both of them fantastic leaders. And I think it's going to create that best opportunity for SAP not to uh, just try to say that, hey, well, it's worked so far. Let's just keep doing the same thing. They'll, they'll do what has worked. And I think both of them are passionate about uh, understanding what customers want and need and driven by that as they go through it. It was one of the things that led Jen to do the Embrace and to uh, that project Embrace, which involved a, a great close partnership with Microsoft and others. So this will be, as always, fun to watch. And Sean, thank you so much for your uh, always intriguing perspectives on things from we work to uh you know laughing at me at my advanced stage here, which i'm still hurt by but I, I, that's that's not how i remember what happened there <laughs> just for the record all right all right sean thanks a million always a pleasure to talk with you Th thank you bob appreciate it and folks thanks to all of you for being with us here at cloud wars live we look forward to seeing you next time bill what do you think Great, great, great. Well, thank you. Sean, right. wonderful stuff. Thanks, Bob. Thanks, Bill. Thanks very much. Thank you, Bill. Right. Thank you. Thank Talk to you guys Thanks, later. Sean. Bye. Thanks. Thanks, Bob. Bye.